Hello, I'm Professor Congleton. This is Public Choice, uh, Lecture 6B, not really uh, Public Economics, uh, Public Choice Module, uh, Lecture 6B. Um, today we're going to talk about um, voting in elections, mass elections, where there are lots and lots of voters. Uh, and, uh, and I drew this picture of a uh, distribution of voter ideal points up. Now, this uh, picture is not meant to be an empirical one. That is, I haven't gone out and surveyed um, everybody in the United States and tried to draw, draw a distribution of voter ideal points that turned up. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the, the distribution looked kind of like this. Um, uh, but that wasn't my intent. Um, my intent was to show you that a distribution of voter uh, preferences um, can look highly irregular. It doesn't have to be bell-shaped. It doesn't have to be linear. Okay, it doesn't have to look like any of the normal uh, statistical distributions that you would study in a st statistics course. Okay, nonetheless, some of the ideas from statistics are moderately useful here, uh, the idea of a median, right? So uh, uh, in this type of diagram, the area underneath the, uh, the curve tells you number of voters or fraction of voters, depending on how you calibrated the, the, uh, the heights, okay? Um, uh, the number of voters with ideal points between two other points, okay? So uh, as in our marginal benefit and marginal cost diagrams, uh, areas turn out to be important in this um, uh, structure too. Uh, and in particular, uh, 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 areas uh, between what we're called the pivotal voter uh, and uh, uh, because that guy will t determine sort of the split of, of voters between uh, uh, the candidates to the left and candidates to the right. So um, uh, I think this kind of distribution is uh, useful for another reason as well, other than the fact that uh, you can think about elect mass elections uh, with uh, billions of people or millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people um, in a way that you couldn't uh, using that uh, matrix technique that we, we used in the previous lecture. Um, uh, first, because uh, it reminds you that people disagree about public policy. Uh, sometimes the way the newspapers report things, uh, sometimes the way candidates talk, it's as if there are only two types of voters, only two types of people. Okay, but in reality, there are all kinds of uh, perspectives on public policies. Um, um, uh, there's a continuum, I guess you could say, of types of policies that exist, and there's a corresponding continuum of voters uh, with ideal points that correspond to those different levels of policies. Um, and that distribution uh, is not necessarily smooth uh, and doesn't necessarily belong to any obvious family of uh, statistical uh, uh, phenomena. So what I'm going to do uh, uh, first uh, is to go through an election. Right? So I'm going to pick uh, two candidates and the candidates are going to be characterized by their policy positions. So the uh, left to center and a right to center uh, uh, voter. And the dead center, you might say, is where the median voter's ideal point is. And I've labeled that point V. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the median voter's ideal point. Uh, and if I've picked the median uh, voter correctly, it should be true that this area here under the curve to the left is exactly the same as the area over here on the right, okay? It should be, the, the two areas should exactly be the same because that will imply that half the votes are on each side of the median voter and that will imply that uh, I've actually identified the voter within the median policy position. Notice there may be many voters with that position, right? So that vertical height gives you a sense of how many uh, voters there are with that particular type of position. Okay, so now let's, uh, make, um, let's imagine there being a, a candidate here um, and a candidate here. Okay, now notice that everybody over here with ideal points over here, if they're spatial voters, they're going to vote in favor of, of CL, candidate of the left, or whatever you want to call this person. Okay, okay. Uh, and if they're out here, in this area, their ideals are up here, they're definitely going to vote for candidate R, right? Uh, the right-of-center candidate. 
these guys in between, uh, they have to kind of make up their minds, right? Because it's not a clean kill, right? Because there are, you know, you know, uh, they're, they're, it, it's not instantly obvious which one's closest to their ideal point. They have to think a little bit. Okay, that's probably not so true of somebody over here or somebody over there, but, you know, kind of in the middle, you have to think a little bit. Okay, well, somewhere in the middle, there's a person who's indifferent between these two candidates. And that indifferent voter uh, is one that's exactly halfway between the two. Okay, the way I've drawn this, I think that's right there. All right, so uh, what does that tell us? Well, the indifferent voter is going to flip a coin to decide which way to vote. Okay, or vote on some kind of crazy um, uh, reason. Maybe it's an uh, astro astrology piece in the newspaper seemed to support one or the other candidates for, for one reason. Okay, he just couldn't make up his mind based on spatial considerations because really they're the same distance uh, from his ideal point or her ideal point. Uh, and there's really no clean kill there, right? So they're, they're, they're kind of stuck. They're in a quandary. Notice that neither of these candidates is ideal for very many people. That's also kind of important information, right? I think uh, that's the way uh, a large number of voters feel when they go to the ballot box. You know, they're thinking about the candidates per se, and even if they're partisans, you know, they're, they're always in the party of the left or they're always in the party of the right. They may, um, uh, you know, have regrets about the person who's actually on the ballot, okay, even from their own party, okay. And so that's true of folks over here, and it's true, folk, true of folks over there. There's only kind of a narrow sliver of the way I've got it drawn, uh, you know, that really is uh, super fond of their uh, other party's candidate. Okay, so let me draw a, a red line down here. Um, and I'll use the kind of TV color. So this would be votes for R. Right, so once you know the indifferent voter, you know who votes for who, right? Everybody who's a little bit to the right of the indifferent voter is closer to CR than they are to CL. They all vote uh, for, for candidate R. Everybody who's a little bit to the left of the indifferent voter votes uh, for uh, <coughs> candidate L. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, the, and the indifferent voters just flip coins. They just divide up equally, roughly, uh, across the two. Uh, two candidates. Okay, so uh, that's what an election looks like. Now, who wins? Well, if you remember the uh, weak form of the median voter theorem, you should know. Right? The weak form of the median voter said, voter theorem said that the median voter always votes with the majority. Who does the median voter vote for? Okay, he votes for candidate L in this particular case. Right? Uh, because he's to the left of the indifferent voter, he's closer to CL. Uh, than uh, CR is. Uh, and so CL wins. Now notice that CL winning, the left, left to center candidate winning, does not necessarily mean that um, that's the final result, right? This is just a snapshot of voter preferences uh, and, and, and candidate positions. Candidates often adjust their positions during the course of an election cycle. Uh, and um, uh, if that happens, uh, then, uh, uh, then the results could change, okay? There are other things going on, by the way, which we don't, aren't taking account of in this, uh, in this diagram, uh, namely that uh, voters are uh, normally not very well informed about candidates uh, when the election season starts. They aren't, aren't all political junkies that do nothing but study the vitas of candidates and party platforms and so forth. They've got other things to do with their time and attention. 
Uh, and so one of the things that goes on during the election is actually the distribution of voters sometimes changes a bit as people learn things about candidates that they didn't know before or learn things about their positions that they didn't know before or learn things about the implications of those positions that they didn't know before. So there's some learning that goes on during the process that makes, uh, say, early snapshots of, of, uh, of, of electoral outcomes um, uh, fuzzy, uh, uncertain, uh, just only kind of rough estimates of, of, of the, what, what, what may actually occur. Now, uh, uh, for the purposes of illustrating the logic of spatial voting in this, uh, uh, in the situation where candidates can change their positions, we're just going to ignore all those inter informational effects, uh, even though they can be quite important. Uh, uh, if we ignore them, we'll be able to focus on sort of the strategic element between the two candidates and, and, and kind of uh, chase out the logic of that um, uh, competition that they face to try to get a majority of voters uh, to vote for them over the other fellow or other gal. So I'm, I'm going to just stop there. So this is going to be a short mini election, and then I'm going to come back next time and I'll do the uh, com competition between two candidates. So you can kind of absorb this material just a little bit, think about it a little bit.